Thank you so much for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, and I'm so sorry that I couldn't be in front of you in person. Uh, uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today is, uh, uh, is the concept that uh, users, uh, when, when they're browsing the web, uh, uh, could potentially feel much more empowered than they do today. And there are many things that technologists, browser technologists could be doing to enable that beyond ad filtering. So if we can just talk about the history of the web for just one minute, um, uh, you know, in the early 1990s, the web was envisioned as uh, this place where users would actively uh, browse and kind of create their own experience as they browsed. That's mostly not the web we have today. Uh, it, today, the web is dominated, of course, by uh, the commercial web. And, you know, that's a good thing. It has brought us a lot of content, but it also has some downsides. Today, someone's experience of using the web is, as you might know, just sc scrolling. Uh, so it's kind of a linear feed that has been constructed for you by algorithmic personalization systems. And the user is kind of treated as a passive target, uh, perhaps to be targeted with content and ads and perhaps to be manipulated. As a result of this, I believe that users have felt a great erosion of their autonomy uh, in their online experience. And I think that is perhaps the core reason why ad blocking and ad filtering have been so successful around the world. Beyond the factor of annoyance, it's the fact that users feel more empowered, more in control, and have more autonomy when browsing the web when they're able to take advantage of ad filtering tools. Uh, but again, my theme here today is that this concept of empowerment uh, of autonomy, I think, can go way beyond ad filtering. And I want to give you uh, a few ideas uh, that I think are potentially promising. So here are the three that I'm going to talk about. The first one is dark patterns. And if some of these terms are not familiar, I'll certainly explain them. Uh, and then uh, algorithmic recommendation systems. And then the last one is an interesting one. It's not so much about commercial content, but rather about political content. Uh, and a lot of this is based on uh, various pieces of research that I've done. And I'll mention that in the relevant places. OK, let's start by talking about dark patterns. You've probably heard the term, but just in case you haven't, dark patterns are user interfaces that trick users, basically, into making decisions that are against their own self-interest. So what kinds of things might those be? Let me start with an example. This is a famous one. Uh, this is from the Norwegian Consumer Council Deceived by Design report that they put out in 2018 that really brought dark patterns to wide attention. So when the GDPR came into force, Facebook designed a consent dialogue for users, and this is what it looks like. If people wanted to take advantage of their rights given to them under the GDPR, then they had to jump through all of these hoops that Facebook put in front of them. Whereas if they wanted to uh, accept all of the uh, data sharing permissions that Facebook wanted them to accept, then they could quickly speed through the set of dialogues by clicking accept and continue. And so this is a fundamental asymmetry in the set of choices that the user has. One set of choices is much harder than the other. It's a way of nudging users into making the choices that Facebook wants them to make. And this is kind of what I mean by an erosion of autonomy. And so this is one example, but I think in the course of our online activities, uh, people experience dozens of these uh, you know, per day. A second example, this is a very common one. You've probably encountered it uh, many times. Uh, so this is an opt-out box for uh, email marketing when you're signing up for a service. So far, so good. Uh, it says if you don't want these messages unticked to opt out. But the funny thing is, this is only part of the screenshot. The rest of the screenshot is right here. It seems like a very similar piece of text, but uh, if you uh, read uh, through the text, it turns out that you have to tick the box in order to opt out. So I think this is very clearly intended to be deceptive and the hope that people won't read this carefully and uh, you know, opt into uh, one of these uh, boxes. A third example, uh, this was pretty notorious in the United States. This is TurboTax. TurboTax many years ago entered into an agreement with the U.S. government that it would offer free tax filing services uh, to eligible people. I think there was an income cutoff and various qualifying features like that. 
And sure enough, if you go to the TurboTax website, it seems like they're complying with that. It says free filing guaranteed and you know zero dollars to file, et cetera. Unfortunately, this turned out to be deceptive. If you actually tried to take advantage of this, it would ask you a series of questions. And no matter what your answers were, it would ultimately tell you that you had to pay for TurboTax's services. If you wanted to take advantage of free filing, that was on a whole different domain. It was not called TurboTax dot com uh, it, and it was a different domain that in fact they had set the robot.txt attributes to make sure that it doesn't even come up in search engine results so and they went to uh, uh, quite a degree of deception in order to uh, prevent people from taking advantage of these uh, free filing services that had in fact been uh, promised to them uh, by the agreement between TurboTax and the government so as a result of this, less than 3% of eligible taxpayers, in fact, were able to take advantage of this free filing opportunity. And recently, I think the Federal Trade Commission uh, has been going after them. So let's let's see what comes out of that. But as you can see, you know, these are prominent companies doing very egregious things uh, in order to do things that are that in order to get users to do things that are against their own self-interests. So we've talked about a few kinds of things here. Uh, TurboTax gets you to pay money. Uh, we talked about Facebook getting you to uh, share data that you might not have wanted to share. And so uh, in another paper, we looked at a bunch of dark patterns. You can see the references, by the way, to all the things that I'm talking about at the bottom of each slide. So we found three main types of dark patterns. Either they want to get users to give them money or uh, or weaken their own privacy protections or uh, to make apps more addictive and to get users to spend more time on those apps. So my point here is that dark patterns are pervasive, they're harmful to users, and if there can be interventions that cut down on dark patterns, that would go a long way towards improving the sense of autonomy that users feel uh, and the sense of trust in online services. So then the question is, what are some ways to protect users from dark patterns? Um, one view is there's nothing to be done, everything is fine, or uh, some people will say, especially in the US, the market will correct itself. If consumers know that they're being tricked in this way, they'll start using other services, and so those service providers will suffer a penalty and they'll stop doing this. Well, you know, it's been uh, at least a decade of dark patterns, and that hasn't happened at all. Dark patterns are only accelerating, and uh, dark patterns threaten to uh, you know, undermine the protections of the GDPR, for instance, if consent is going to be uh, tricked out of users instead of freely given. And I think this understanding is already uh, very much there among EU policymakers. And so uh, uh, recent efforts like the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act have started to take a look at dark patterns. So I think that's good. Law and policy does need to be one important response to dark patterns. I don't think that can be the whole response. And here are some reasons why. Now, one reason is the jurisdiction of the company. Yeah, it might not necessarily be possible uh, to go after companies located everywhere around the world. And what about users not located in the EU? I think, uh, for example, in the US, regulation is generally on these types of consumer protection issues has been lagging well behind the European Union. Many other parts of the world don't have equivalent laws. Those are some reasons, but also dark patterns are very subtle and fuzzy to define. There has been a lot of academic effort trying to figure out exactly how to draw the line on what are dark patterns and what are not. And I think uh, regulators are also going to struggle with that. And companies are you know, smart enough that they will be able to work around the, the gray areas that are going to exist in any regulation. And so I think this is law is an important response, but it shouldn't be the only response. So my pitch to you is that it can be very valuable to build a browser tool to block dark patterns or warn users or have some other kind of intervention. I don't believe any such tool exists today. Uh, when we started doing the research on this a few years ago, and I'll show you a little bit about that research, uh, we had hoped ju that just like research on web tracking led to robust tracking protection tools and extensions in browsers, we had hoped that research on dark patterns will lead to similar tools, but that has actually not happened in the five years or so uh, since um, uh, you know, dark patterns research uh, started revealing how prevalent they are.
So that's why I'm talking to you about this today. So what are some possible interventions? I think there are many things that a browser tool could do. Uh, well, here's one simple example. One of the most common yet damaging types of dark patterns is that is websites or services that will make it very easy to subscribe for a service, but make it hard to cancel. You have to be on the phone with a customer service person, and they will, uh, you know, they will ask you all kinds of uh, questions, give you all kinds of options to try to um, nudge you towards staying on the service. Uh, and uh, personally, I think I would really benefit when I'm trying to sign up for a service if there could be a little warning bubble that said, hey, you know, before you sign up for this, keep in mind that canceling is going to be hard. Or in some cases, in a lot of shopping websites, we see that there are many pop-ups that consistently try to pressure users into a sale. And the response to that could be to simply block certain uh, elements in the DOM. It could be as simple as that. And another common type of dark pattern is that if there is a choice to accept or reject cookies, for instance, the choice to reject might be grayed out to trick users into thinking that it's actually not selectable. So again, a simple response there to be would be to make the reject button more prominent. Oh, excuse me. Uh, don't know what's going on. Sorry, I don't know if there was a mishap on your screen, but I clicked away from my slide and confused myself for a second. Apologies if you saw my desktop there. Okay. Um, uh, another possibility would be that uh, the browser tool or browser extension could actually make choices on the user's behalf. Uh, I believe there's actually a tool called Consentomatic that does this. So uh, if the user's choice is to always reject cookies on all uh, websites that choice could be made you know, could be implemented uh, on their behalf uh, by the browser tool. So those are all some ideas. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you're thinking about this from a technical perspective, the key difficulty in all of these is that you would need a filter list, a filter list of dark patterns on the web, analogous to filter list of trackers, for instance. So is it possible to build such a list? Excuse me, I have a bit of a cough here. Um, my kid has just started daycare, so it's been uh, one infection after another. Uh, I apologize for that. Okay, so my claim is that it's in fact possible to build a dark patterns filter list. And we actually came pretty close to this in some research that we did on dark patterns, even though building a filter list was not a goal of ours, so we didn't fully try that, but I believe it's possible. So let me tell you about that research. The goal of this research was to look for dark patterns on uh, a large scale on shopping websites specifically. And we did end up finding them on over a thousand such websites. And you can see the reference to the paper at the bottom. Uh, and we found a number of other concerning things. In fact, there are 22 entities that provide dark patterns as a service that publishers could simply drop into their websites. So the reason I'm telling you about this is that in order to do this, the way we went about doing this was we built a bot that uh, could actually go and interact on these shopping websites, explore all parts of the sites, just as a user would do. Web automation has come a long way. And even in 2018, we were able to do this. And I believe that today it would be possible to do it even more easily and do much more sophisticated things. So it would, you know, it would go to different product pages, select different options, as you can see on the screen here, um, navigate through those choices, add items to the bag. Uh, and the reason we needed to do this is because dark patterns could be on any part of the site. It might not just be on the homepage. It might only appear when you add an item to the bag. One of the common types of dark patterns is what is called a sneak into basket dark patterns. You add an item, but the website has sneakily added a related item to your bag. <clears throat> Um, it also had functionality to automatically segment web pages into its constituent components, do a little bit of analysis of the pieces to kind of visually identify what might be the dark patterns on there. <clears throat> we also did things like going after deceptive countdown timers. This is an example of a deceptive countdown timer. Why is it deceptive? Because it says the offer ends at an hour, but after the timer ends, 
it just resets back to zero. So our bot had the functionality to sit and wait there for an hour and check if it resets uh, back to uh, you know one hour or not. Uh, and we were able to find deceptive countdown timers on dozens, perhaps hundreds of websites. Yeah, so we got pretty far. It, you know, this was uh, this was not a comprehensive list of dark patterns, but we were able to catch many types of dark patterns this way. It involved some uh, uh, unsupervised machine learning techniques as well. And I think this work offers a blueprint for being able to construct and maintain a filter list of all dark patterns online. And I think this is very much doable. And I would love for there to be a browser tool that enabled this. Um, you know, I think a lot of users, um, uh, just like when you uh, use ad filtering or ad blocking tools and you see the difference before and after, and then when you come back to the web with ads on it, it's kind of a shock. I think users have not had that experience with dark patterns, how much better the web could be experienced if you were able to block or otherwise mitigate the effects of dark patterns. So I think this would be a very interesting technology to build. So let me go to my second one. I'm going to talk about the second and third relatively quickly. The second one is algorithmic recommendations. Of course, this is how we uh, consume a lot of content online. Every social media site is driven by an algorithmic recommendation engine. Over the last decade, we have seen so many concerns about these algorithms, uh, including you know, uh, uh, claims that uh, Facebook amplified hateful content in Myanmar and contributed to genocide, so things that can be very, very serious misinformation, polarization, people getting into echo chambers, um, uh, you know, rabbit holes of content. And also uh, maybe uh, things that are not as horrific, but still nonetheless quite harmful to individuals. And one of those could be just seeing content that you don't want to see and, it, you know, and, the, and the recommendation system is repeatedly pushing that to you. Um, so Mozilla has been researching this kind of issue. They have uh, a Firefox extension called Regrets Reporter, and they've been collecting a lot of crowdsourced data through Regrets Reporter. And just last week, they put out a report. Again, you can see a reference at the bottom. And what that report showed is that if people tried to tell YouTube they don't want to see a particular kind of video by clicking the dislike button, then that action was not very effective. People still kept getting recommendations for the same kind of content. There was only maybe, if I remember the paper correctly, about a 10% reduction. So what could be an example of this? Uh, so in this example, you see on the left, uh, this is the video that the user regrets. It's an example of war footage uh, of the ongoing war, and the user doesn't want to see that. But YouTube, nonetheless, keeps recommending similar content, in fact, from a channel called War Shock. And I'm going to show you another example of this. I should get I should mention a content warning. It's it's a little bit gory content, but this is a screenshot from their paper. So bear with me for uh, just for a few seconds while I go through this slide. Uh, so this is uh, in this example, the user doesn't want to see content from horror movies, uh, but nonetheless, they are still recommended similar content. Now, I have actually myself experienced something like this. I didn't even make the connection until. Uh, you know, I didn't make the connection when I was reading their paper, only when I was preparing for this talk did I realize this is something I have experienced. Uh, I tend to get easily addicted to video games and lose, you know, months of time uh, playing games. And then after uh, a difficult process, I quit the game. And all it takes, uh, at least for me, is one YouTube video of someone live streaming uh, that game, uh, for instance, for me to uh, be triggered into watching that. And then it's one YouTube video after another. And soon enough, I'm playing that game again. And so I think this is an issue that lots and lots of people experience. Uh, and so Mozilla pointed this out. What was interesting about this especially is YouTube's response. YouTube said, oh, no, this is working as intended because uh, we're not going to censor out entire topics or viewpoints. Right? So YouTube's position, you know, when a user says, I don't want to watch war uh, content, war footage, is that that would be censoring out topics or viewpoints so that YouTube is not going to do that. I think that's pretty unfortunate. I think this is something that where a lot of users wish that the web would work better uh, um, uh, in terms of their needs. And so my view here is that if YouTube is not going to fix this, I think this is ideal for a browser extension to fix, not just on YouTube, but throughout the web, 
have a way for users to say, these are the types of content that I don't want to watch. These are personally harmful to me, and I want to be able to opt out of them wherever I encounter them. Uh, it could be as simple as running a simple classifier in the browser to hide certain you know, video recommendations or whatever it is. Uh, and it could be, in fact, the browser extension could go one step further uh, and, um, in fact, uh, train YouTube's algorithm on behalf of the user. Um, so the extension could automatically click dislike every time the user encounters uh, a similar type of content, or uh, it could click on the don't recommend this channel ever again button, which this study found works a little bit better than the dislike button. So I think there's a lot of room here in, in making sure that the universe of algorithmic recommendations works on behalf of the user and not on not just on behalf of the company to keep users passively clicking and consuming more content. So that was the second idea. Um, the third idea is in a little bit of a different vein. This is about deceptive political emails. So this is, again, based on research that we did. In the 2020 US election cycle, there were a lot of reports that political candidates were using deceptive methods uh, when they were emailing their supporters in order to basically trick their supporters into giving them money or perhaps more money than they might otherwise have given. And so we wanted to study this. We wanted to study this systematically. And, uh, you know, one thing that my uh, uh, grad students have been uh, really good at, and I, I've uh, I think this is this has been the reason why we've been able to do a lot of this research is browser automation. So what they were able to do, uh, and the lead author here is Arunesh Mathur, and what they were able to do is create a bot that uh, looked for you know all kinds of political candidates online as well as political parties, other political organizations, in the 2020 U.S. elections, and um, signed up for thousands of them, and in fact received emails from. 2,000, uh, pardon me, more than 3,000 of these candidates uh, for a total of over 400,000 emails, as you can see at the bottom. And all of these can be browsed on our website. It's electionemails2020.org. And so we wrote a paper based on this corpus. Um, so let me show you what that looked like. Um, uh, let me show you one example email. Uh, the main finding, by the way, is that the majority of emails are manipulative in some way. So what do I mean by manipulative? Here is one example. This is the subject line of an email. Think about what you know what what you would what what you would think if uh, you saw this in your inbox. It looks like maybe it's an email from your bank uh, saying that your you know uh, money is being held up or something like that. That was that would be the first instinct that people would have, and they would click on it. But it turns out that this is an email from a political candidate asking for money. And this was just one deceptive pattern. There are a variety of others. Um, and you can read our paper on the link that I showed. And this had some press coverage as well. Help My Candidate is Dying is, it, you know, pretty much captures the tone of a lot of these emails, uh, making these kinds of various kinds of trick, um, you know, deceptive or desperate pleas in order to get people to give them money. And um, our former president was uh, very famous for this, and not only deceptive emails, but the donation website itself was deceptive and tricked people into making recurring donations. Uh, and this totaled up to you know hundreds of millions of dollars, and there was a lot of press reporting about this as well. One of the depressing things for me when I talk about this research is that a lot of people just react like, oh yeah, politicians, what are you going to do? And that's, I don't know, that's very surprising to me. I don't think we should just accept this as the way things are. I think this can be very dangerous. If these kinds of deceptive practices are left unchecked, then what that means is that the least scrupulous candidates are going to be the ones who are going to be the most successful. By the way, I'm very curious to hear from, uh, from folks in the audience whether a similar kind of thing is happening in other countries as well. I don't have much knowledge outside the US. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if things are as bad elsewhere in the world. But at least in the US, what we've found is that deception is not only very prevalent, but is a very successful fundraising tactic. So what can be done? Uh, you know, based on what I've said in the previous examples in my talk, you might imagine that I would say that we should build a browser extension to warn people when they're seeing a deceptive claim in an email, or maybe build a new email service that would perhaps filter out these emails or put a warning sign or whatever. 
I don't think that's really a good solution because as we know, any of these technical tools are only going to be used by a you know, relatively small fraction of tech savvy people. And those are not the people who are, you know, mostly not the people who are falling for these kinds of detective, deceptive tactics. Anyway, when we look at the demographics, it's mostly elderly people, for instance. And so helping individual users to avoid deception is not going to help the, the majority of users who are falling prey to this. And it's not going to help the collective problem. It might help certain users avoid falling for these scams, but it's still going to be as harmful to democracy because there's a large set of users out there who are opening, their, opening up their wallets in response to these unscrupulous tactics. So what to do about this? Let me present a kind of wacky and subversive idea, just, you know, just to kind of throw it up for a discussion. And that's sort of the last thing that I'll say. Um, I, I think it's technically feasible. I don't know how good an idea, you know, kind of politically it is, but it, here's the thought. And so it is, it is a browser extension. Uh, what it will do is it will automatically click the spam button when encountering these manipulative political emails based on some classifier. You know, I, I think the technology for exactly how to do that is secondary, but I think it's possible. The idea here, though, is not so much to, to protect the specific user of the browser extension, but the idea is that if enough people install and use this extension, it will train, let's say, Gmail spam filter and various other spam filters with the hope that those manipulative emails will go to spam for everyone, even for people who are not using this extension. Um, I, I don't know if this will work, but I, I don't know. I think it's maybe worth a try. At least it's uh, worth discussion. And the effect of this could be that manipulative senders will not be able to reach as many recipients anymore. And this might disincentivize manipulative political discourse. Yeah, so let me know what you think about this. So one last thought here is that someone might say, you know, is, is any of this a good business model? Why would, why would companies want to do this? Um, I honestly don't know. They might not be. But on the other hand, they might be. I think at the beginning of ad blocking, people didn't think that would be a good business model either. But ultimately, I think you know these are ways to align the interests of uh, users and companies, and I think you know uh, uh, enforcing those standards can ultimately possibly turn into a good business model. Uh, but then again, maybe not. So what I want to say here is that even if it's not a good business model. Maybe the, the web community kind of has a moral obligation to build these kinds of tools. And that's because we, uh, we have something today, the open web, that's very precious. We have all benefited from it. Uh, it's almost a historical accident. It might have been that the web could have been you know, a closed platform if uh, uh, Netscape had not open sourced Mozilla and uh, Microsoft was dominating the web, it could have ended up as, as a de facto closed platform. And so I think we're lucky that we have the open web and I think we need to protect it. We can't take it for granted that the open web will always exist. And one way to protect it is to get more people invested in it by showing them, by giving them tools that are only possible on the open web and not on closed platforms, like the tools that I have, uh, that I have proposed which will help them understand that there are ways in which they can benefit from this autonomy on the web that they cannot on closed platforms, and therefore that is something precious and worth defending. So maybe we owe it to the open web, maybe we owe it to users to build more of these user empowerment tools, even if the business model is not quite obvious. So that's, that's my last thought, and uh, I'll stop here, and perhaps if we have time for questions, I would be happy to chat.